uh, now I'm very happy to have a chance to uh, present uh, Louisa Heinrich, who is the, um, the uh, director of strategy for uh, Fjord. And Fjord is a, um, a service industry design group. They have uh, business all over the world. Uh, and uh, from my conversation with Louisa, I can see why. She, is a, she has a lot of not only brilliant insights, but also very poetic ones. And uh, her talk is going to be about what, uh, what happens in the city environment today. How can we transform them? It's a very large vision of things, but at the same time with wonderful details. I'm looking forward to listen to Louisa Hendry. Please give her a nice welcome. I've got to say, following Susan is uh, terrifying. I'm glad half the room has left. Um, I don't think I could have done it otherwise. But hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the city and content in an urban environment and what that might mean in the future. But um, first, I thought I'd give you a little bit of context for the stuff I'm going to say, which might sound weird to you. I work in something called service design. It's kind of a new term. So to give you some idea of what I'm talking about, what exactly is service design? Think about a service, the postal service. Doesn't matter where you live in the world, well, most places in the world now, you have something resembling a postal service, right? What is that, really? We're surrounded by services. We don't even usually think about what they are or how they work. They're, they are complex systems with thousands of moving pieces. They come in so many flavors, and they have so many different ways that we can interact with them, but we only see a fraction of what it takes to make these things go. So what we try to do in service design is solve the system. We try to figure out how the whole system works and how to make it really easy for normal human beings to engage with the system without having to understand everything, right? Talk to this guy. He brings you your post. You like him. You don't care about the sorting machine. So when we think about services, some of them have changed really dramatically over time, right? I don't know how many of you recognize this as a telephone system, but we all know the difference in the physical objects that we use from day to day. Um, some services still have the same kind of infrastructure, public transit. Used to be done by horses, cable cars. Now we only really notice this stuff when it doesn't work. Think about a light switch. Electricity, one of the first services that we all had in, in, in the Western world. These are so ingrained that we don't think about them at all anymore. We don't think about it as service. We don't think about it as technology. It just is. So at Fjord, we do digital services. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things that we've worked on. But instead of just talking about the, the project, a challenge that I see is that digital services need a lot of attention. And the Baroness was talking about how our minds change based on how much attention we give to these screens. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of different ways of looking at this stuff. The thing is that when you think about digital services, to really get to grips with them, either you have to understand the original. And this is the BBC iPlayer. Um, anybody familiar with content knows about this thing, right? But in order to really wrap your head around what you're meant to do with this thing, you kind of have to know what the BBC is. You kind of have to know about the content. You have to understand the ground level system in order to be able to engage with this thing. Or something like Skype. Communication, talking to each other, typed, face to face, vo voice contact. It's just a whole different way of doing stuff. It's a different way of doing things that we've never seen before. No matter what it is that you're engaging with, you have to choose to engage with it. You have to give it your attention. You have to s let yourself go into it. And the digital and the physical worlds are only starting to come together now. We're starting to get location-based stuff. We're starting to get some interesting things. But you still have to look at a screen, hold a screen, look away from the world around you in order to engage with digital services. And, and I think it would be so cool if we could bring some of this stuff and make it part of the fabric of the world that we live in so we don't have to exit the real world and pay attention to a screen instead. And... Uh, this is the last bit of the preamble. So as human beings, we're building more and more complex personal systems of hardware that we carry around. One of the things that, uh, one of the things that I've started to notice in some of my friends who are, I guess, probably on the bleeding edge of early adoption is they don't even have smartphones anymore. Right? They've given up on them. Now they buy like the smallest, they're back to the whole like credit card sized phone that just makes calls and sends text messages. 
and then they also have a Kindle and an iPad and a God knows what, and they, they just carry around whichever of their devices they feel like they might want uh, for, the, for the kind of data they're going to have. And at the same time, we've got new hardware like this thing. I don't know who, I don't know how many of you were here for Tommy Ahonen's talk yesterday, but he actually had one of these with him. It's a the really small smartphone that can project a two meter wide picture on the wall of your hotel room. So new hardware is changing the way that we do things that we've been doing for a long time. And one of the most important things that we don't think about often enough, I think, is that some of the hardware that's out there now knows so much, not, not just about me and about who my friends are on Facebook, but about where I'm standing and what the temperature is and how loud it is around me or what the light is like or how fast I'm moving. Am I running? Am I standing still? Um, these are all things that we can make better use of. We're not doing much with all this information yet. Uh, the way that we receive information is changing too, right? This is a vision of the future from the uh, 60s, I believe. And okay, it's not quite that cool, but um, we're already seeing heads-up displays. We're already seeing new ways of engaging with augmented reality. This is not far out. This is not futuristic vision land. This is, you know, 18 months, maybe two years before this kind of stuff is available to us, to our kids. So that will mean, maybe, that we can carry around just whatever bits and pieces we feel like we want to use that day, whether it's glasses that show us pictures or just a little piece that we put on our ear to make calls and send texts. But what that means is that we can start thinking about creating a different kind of experience that's much more ambient, that's much more immersive, that's much more natural. And, uh, and we stop with this sort of dual world of look at screen, look at world. So that's sort of the personal and digital context. And now a little bit about what we know about cities in the future, right? There's, there's a couple of really obvious things. So some kinds of infrastructure change really slowly. This is the London tube map a long time ago. And this is it today. And it's really not that different. Um, but some other kinds of infrastructure change really, really fast. Broadband penetration, mobile broadband, and the speed at which we can get data from one place to another has increased at an insane pace. But the concept of what it means to have a city is evolving too. Um, this is a, an, an experimental design from a, from a Norwegian company. Hasn't been built yet, no plans, but this, this, this is the idea of what, what happens when we run out of surface area on the planet to put all the people in. What can we do that's different and that's more sustainable? This is the High Line in New York. Um, urban environments are changing shape and texture. This, is, uh, this project took an old uh, railway that used to serve the meatpacking district in New York and turned it into a beautiful park that runs, through, that runs through what was once one of the uglier parts of the city, one of the more gritty industrial parts of the city. We, we are thinking about new ways to be urban. We're trying to bring nature back into the urban environment. At the same time, um, we don't really know what's going to happen with our environment. We know it's going to be different. And we know that there's going to be a lot more people. The, uh, the UN predicts an average of 57 million more people on the planet every year. So that's another billion by 2015. New ways of living, uh, this means new ways of living. This means new ways of living on top of each other and in each other's pockets and coping with each other. Um, this is a super interesting concept from Japan. So uh, again, some people that I know who uh, refer to themselves or we refer to them as global nomads. These are people who don't actually have a home. They don't have a flat or a house anywhere. They sort of skip around. They go somewhere and work for a couple of months. When they get tired of that place, they go somewhere else, work on something different for a couple of months. And Th this would be an ideal thing for them to be able to have for a couple of days here and there when they're in transit. Um, we've already got pod hotels going up in Heathrow. You've got some of these ideas starting to come up. This is a different way of thinking about ourselves and our presence in the urban landscape. We also need, we also need more information and have more information thrown at us. And this is content and the advertising that funds content and, and all of the information that we need in order to not wander into traffic. More information is inevitable. So how do we make the city beautiful again? How do we weave something into the fabric of this that, that is nice, that is enjoyable, and how do, we, how do we use digital and content to do that? 
So I think the answer is, or begins with thinking about content as service layers. This is not a new idea, this idea of augmented reality and looking at the world through lenses. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. We've, we've had headsets in the museum where we can listen to people tell us what that painting's all about. We've had this stuff for a long time, but I'm more interested in what's next. So I've got four things that I kind of want to throw at you, and uh, you'll all probably look at me like I'm nuts, and maybe I am. But the first thing is the secret life of things. So uh, how many people know what Arduino is? Awesome, almost nobody. Um, so Arduino is open source hardware. And essentially what that means is uh, it's, it's a very simple construct, um, and anyone can make a piece of hardware with it. This is a good example. So the guys at, at an agency called Poke in London made Baker Tweet. They have a bakery across the road, and each of them was addicted to something else that that bakery made. So they made this little gizmo for them that whenever they take something out of the oven, they turn it to, for instance, croissant, push a button, and the oven tweets, fresh croissant. So everybody in the neighborhood follows the, tweet, follows the Twitter feed and goes running down there to get the croissant while they're hot. Um, is this going to change the world? Probably not. But does this make people's lives more pleasant? Yes. Does it make, does it make the world a little bit more personal, a little bit, a little bit less impersonal? For sure. I mean, this kind of stuff has got practical applications. If, if telephone poles and zebra crossings and, uh, and traffic signals and cars can talk to you or can talk to each other, we could probably make the road a safer place to be. But also, if you think about the concrete jungle, Knowing where things are going on that I like can make that place less daunting to me. It can, make, it can make the city feel more alive to me. And I think this is a really, really interesting concept that we could do a lot with. The second thing is this idea of lenses. And uh, I don't know how many content creators there are in here right now, but there's so much content out in the world about how we used to be, how we used to live, this place as it was 50 years, 100 years, 2,000 years ago. And our choice at this point is either we look at the history or we look at what's around us. Again, it's the screen real life dichotomy. So what if when we've got 4G bandwidth, heads up displays, I can look at both at the same time? I can stand in Paris Platz and see it as it was in 1935 and 1945 and today. Um, I, can, I can have layers that go through time if I'm interested. Or I can have layers that show me what's around me and explain the world to me in a way that doesn't require me to leave the experience that I'm having. I think that, uh, that what's really required for this is a different way of thinking about content. It's not about content as a packaged entity that you shove down a pipe and there's somebody at the other end who hopefully consumes it and then somebody in the middle who will help you pay for it, but rather to think about it as individual moments that are useful or relevant or touching or, or interesting to people. Um, on, a, on an even more personal level, here is the new here, right? So uh, we are connected creatures more and more so with Facebook, with Twitter, with the magical interweb. Um, we are more connected to each other or have the capability to be more connected to each other than we ever have before. But does that mean we're close? There's a, there's a lot to be said, and I'm, I'm with the Baroness about, about the fact that 10% of contact goes through words, and most of it goes through what you see and what you experience being in the same room with somebody. But if you think about what we see and what we experience, what we see, what we hear, a lot of that could be shared. I mean, if I have access to technology that, that picks up what the temperature's like, the ambient sound around me, stuff like that, I can transmit that to a friend 4,000 miles away, and we could take a walk together, even though she's in Chicago and I'm in Berlin. We could feel like we are more together than we've ever been able to be before. And this is just about our content that we make by existing in the place that we're in. Finally, and uh, right, nobody from the BBC in here, at least nobody that I know, but um, so. Uh, thinking about the city as a giant film set or a giant television set. We've already got this stuff, right? Where am I? What's nearby? What is interesting to me around here? Well, what if we take that a level further? Um, what if I can see the content that was shot here? So I might be able to spend the day in Sherlock Holmes' London. Or I might be able to take pictures or 
take a tour of Harry Potter's London where I take a photo and I'm standing on platform nine and a half instead of just in the middle of a station? Um, what if I could see the city in my favorite character's eyes? So the stylized, the fantasized version of the city. This is another kind of lens, I suppose, but this is about merging my world with the imaginary world that I might love and, uh, and being able to engage with it in a new and different way. And uh, anybody who watches Doctor Who will remember this. Um, I think this would be a really hot attraction if people were able to take pictures of themselves standing in front of that. So in conclusion, I guess what I'm trying to say is we need to think differently about content and about services and about how we connect these, how, how we connect content with human beings. Because it, the way that we've been thinking about it historically is here is the content, here is the pipe, how do we get more stuff through the pipe to more people and make more money out of it. Not that, that's, not that the money part is a bad thing and not that the getting the content to the people part is a bad thing, but we need to stop thinking about the pipe. We need to stop trying to predict which way is going to win. That's not what's most important because that might change. That might change every six months. That might change every two years. And if we, if we bet the farm on one outcome, we're going to be screwed because even if we're right in the short term, we're not going to be right forever. So it is, for me, about understanding the connection between pe the people and the things that they love and the things that they care about and the things that move them and finding ways to strengthen those connections, finding ways to bring those things together. I think that's the way that we, can f that we can meet the potential that the technology brings us and the potential that the content that we make gives us. And that's all I've got. Wow, presentation that didn't run over. <laughs> Lovely. When I had a conversation with Louisa before, the, it's, the phrase that recurred the most was, and I would put the number six on your, on your screen, was pushing the limits, right? That every time you got onto a technology or in a, a situation, a connection between environment and person, uh, you found a way to, to, to push the limits. That's something that, that what makes you a strategy director. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I first a personal question. Would you like to, are you a global nomad? Uh, no, I'm not. I, uh, I, I, I do. I, I've lived in lots of places, but I, I tend to put down roots. I have, I have good friends who are and who live like that. And there are times when I'm a little bit envious of them, but I like to nest. Um, yeah. I, I travel a lot, but I like to have somewhere to come home to. And that's what I thought would everybody have, but those people don't need it. No, they that's really the, don't. It's a, there's a whole lot of new types of people that are emerging from the society in, in which we are. An, an, another question that I had was the um, to get the road to talk to you. Um, I wanted to know how you differ, how you distinguish the Arduino, for example, or the things that you are pro uh, proposing from uh, what is happening and, co and coming under the name of new, uh, near field communication. Is it the same thing or do you find a different kind of use of it? Uh, well, near field communication is just a, it's a series of protocols for things that are close together to talk to one another, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I see that as a tool. I mean, Ar Arduino is a different kind of, s it's a different order of tools, right? It's, it's, um, it's about making your own hardware out of whatever you want. And near-field yeah. communications, rather like Wi-Fi or 4G or 3G even, or any other kind of protocol for the transfer of information, is another piece of the puzzle. I mean, I think that when it comes to technology, these are all pieces of the infrastructure mm -hmm. that is required to make any of this stuff go. And I'm, to be honest, I'm making a fair amount of assumptions mm -hmm. about what's going to happen in the next couple of years. I'm assuming that because operators are now not so worried about not having enough bandwidth as how to manage and monetize the bandwidth that they have, I'm assuming that means that in another three years or so, we don't have to worry about that level of infrastructure anymore. And would that be a do-it-yourself kind of situation? Don't know, yeah. maybe. I mean, it, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you know, along the lines of what Matt was saying, the, some people will start hacking stuff, start making stuff, mm -hmm. and the mass market will follow. The other thing is about the uh, here, the, um, <coughs> the here here. Uh, it, what you're su suggesting, in fact, is, it, it is a series of city skins. 
right? It's a kind of an overlay of, of the situation where you're in. That's what I, would, sure. that be, would that be the kind of thing? Sure. Uh, well, that's, that's a, a very provoking idea as well. Is there a question in the audience? Because I think we still have one, mi one or two minutes for this. <coughs> we are catching up on time, thanks to your wonderful <laughs> accuracy. I'd like to be brief. Anybody? Yes? Hi, I'm uh, uh, Dick Ramt. I uh, have to congratulate you on this very inspiring uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it, it, it actually showed me a couple of things that I didn't realize, and I just loved it. Um, so what are the biggest challenges that you see to, to uh, make this happen, or let it happen, basically? Uh, okay, there's a couple that are springing to mind, and I'm probably going to forget something important, so feel free to check me, audience. But... Uh, Rights, ownership. Right. Ownership is going to be the biggest thing. Who owns what and, and how do we control its release and how do we monetize it, right? So, so because of the way that we structure ownership of content now, that's going to be a huge thing to overcome as, because essentially everything needs to be fragmented in order to work in this world, right? So I think that's the biggest battle. And then you've also got a couple of far more prosaic problems around uh, metadata and taxonomy and, and how you match up, uh, how you match things together and, and create the logic that, that, that assembles this world. But yeah, I think ownership is going to be the biggest one. So what's, what's the key um, message you, you would like to give to content owners and distributors? Because those are the ones that... He said it. <laughs> Listen to him. I, was, I wasn't there, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, uh, it was an earlier talk about, about uh, the pirate's dilemma and the, and the fact that... Um, Thinking, thinking about content ownership in really grabby terms is almost never the right idea, right? I, IP is important, but it, it is also constantly evolving. And, uh, and the more we can sort of free ourselves from this idea of, I have made it mine, my mine, and open ourselves up to new ways of getting value out of the things that we have made, the better off we'll be. And it's about, ch it's about a different mindset. All right, but that, uh, let's assume uh, that I'm the CEO of a big broadcaster, right? And I, well, I have content rights and I distribute it. And that's all nice and fine, And but the, my job is on the line. So what are you going to do to console me? I would probably try to show you how you're going to get other revenue streams in this world that will n certainly not be less and very likely be a good deal more than your traditional revenue streams. Yeah, that would console me a lot. <laughs> Usually does. <coughs> There's another, <coughs> another question. Hi, thanks, it was fantastic. Um, at the moment, we look at things like augmented reality. It's a lot of augmented reality developers making it rather than musicians and storytellers. What do you think needs to happen so that the, the people who are creating this other kind of content can start creating this new kind of stuff rather than having to go to someone who's an expert on, on doing that? Does that make sense? <coughs> it does. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's a really good question. Uh, the thing is that the technology is still quite new, and uh, uh, anyone who's used augmented reality stuff has, has seen how incredibly clunky it is right now. And uh, uh, I think a couple of things are going to happen. One, as more bespoke projects happen that show how augmented reality can make storytelling better, uh, there will be more of a push to make it more accessible. This is this is usually how new software-based technology takes shape, right? That's at first it's really super hard to work with, and it's really super hard to do what you want with. Then a few people do some really interesting projects. It kind of enters the mass consciousness, and then it it speeds up. Development speeds up, and you've got because you've got a whole lot more people working on it. Right now, there also isn't a really good open source AR framework. Uh, as soon as that happens, we'll be there. We'll be there really fast after that, I think. Great. Well, I think that we have to leave the, to the table to another speaker. And so I would like to thank you very much, Louisa, for an inspiring and wonderful uh, talk and great tipping points. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.